Last week we uh, began our Christmas series called Behold uh, the Christ. And we took a, kind of a deep look at these couple of verses. So let's walk back through them because it kind of prepares us for today. But in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, it said, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And we realized how a lot of scientists would say that was the Big Bang, and how like 10 verses later, God actually created the sun and the moon. And so, their light being the light of the world, which is Christ. And then we look at John chapter 1, and saw this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind, all humanity, all human beings. And then we know also, if you drop down to verse 14 of that, it says, and then the Word became flesh and lived among us. Well, in just a few minutes we're going to see how these verses actually lay the groundwork for today to help us to, let's see, believe bigger and to think greater things and to really understand who is this Christ that we were to behold. Was it really a baby wrapped in a man? Was that really the behold? The Christ? Was that really the main thing we were to behold? And I promise you this. As we look into it today, if we will look at it with the eyes of our soul and the ears of our heart, we'll listen to those things, we'll find out that it wasn't something just for 2,000 years ago or six, seven, eight thousand years ago. We will realize the power and what that means for us today. So we're going to pray. We'll continue to worship a little bit more song, and then we'll come back and see if we can't figure this out, all right? God, thank you for uh, how mighty and majestic you really are. Thank you, God, for how you're greater than our minds are. And that, God, that you have tried to put things in words, which are all metaphors of who you really are, that we might have some kind of understanding, God, of who you are and who we are in you. And so, God, would you illuminate our minds, our heart, our spirit, God, everything about us to be yielded to the truth and the power of your spirit today. In Christ's name, amen. All right. Well, as we open ourselves up to um, a much greater understanding of the Scriptures, um, because it, it is very easy to just regurgitate what you've been taught. And I'll never forget the first time I experienced or was challenged with that kind of statement. And I was so angry. I was at Mercer University. Uh, I was a freshman, you know, came in full of you know what and vinegar and thought I knew everything and had to, you know, worry about the tail and all this kind of stuff of this young, you know, uh, Gaston kind of theologian. And, and I'll never forget one of my professors asking me to meet him uh, in his office, one of my religion professors. So I went and sat with him and he asked me a few questions and he said, is that really what you believe? I said, absolutely. He said, no, I'm telling you what I've discovered about you. He said, that's what you've been taught and told that you believe. You've yet to search it out for yourself. And I was so <laughs> mad, I wanted to punch that old man right in the throat. But what made me the most angry was, he was right. I was simply, simply repeating what I had heard. And I never really opened myself up to the, the Spirit and what the Scriptures really say uh, and not what someone tells me that they say. So I want you to take everything that I ever say, and Pastor Ray feels the same way, and go search it for yourself. You know, get, get along with God and, and, and the Word and, and search it out for yourself and don't just take it as face value. But I believe as we do and we open ourselves up to the Christ, and not just the Jesus. We talked a lot about that last week, understanding this Christ Jesus. It's not Jesus Christ, like Christ is His last name, all right? As we do that, we begin to wrestle with verses like this in John chapter 8, verse 12. It says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have, they will also have the light of life. But then Jesus says this in John chapter 9, verse 5, 
And I read this a thousand times but never caught it. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So with that as the backdrop, we have to now look at Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 14. This is Jesus speaking again. He says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. You being you, me, us, mankind, humanity. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. It's a... Okay, Clayco boy. Let me see if I can get this straight. Christ says that he is the light of the world. And then it says, Jesus says that he is the light while he was on the earth. Christ is the light of the world. Jesus says that he was the light while he was on the earth. And then Christ tells us that now we are the light of the world. Christ is the light of the world. Jesus. Now we're the light of the world. Now the scriptures also teach us that's, um, that everything is created, is created through Christ. We just read it. There's another passage in Colossians that even goes a step further, and it says that Christ is all and is in all. These aren't my words, they're the Bibles. It also teaches us in Genesis 1.27 that we are created in the image of God. That's what the Bible teaches us. You say, Jeff, listen, so what, what are you getting at? I mean, what is the point you're trying to make? Well, if we will continue the stories of the Bible, if we want to keep going with Bible stories and see where the dots connect and how this all flows, then we will discover this. That in the book of Acts, after Jesus' resurrection, all right, Acts chapter 11, verse 26, the second half of the verse says this, the disciples were called Christians first in the city of Antioch. Jesus said, the Christ said, I am the light of the world. Jesus said, while I'm walking the earth in this body, I'm the light of the world. Matthew chapter 5, he says, you are the light of the world. The word Christian, this is after Jesus, the physical body of Jesus, has left. This word Christian literally means little Christ. They didn't ask to be called that. They didn't say our new name is titles to be called Christian. The way that they lived, the way that they allowed the love and the light of Christ to flow through them, they looked at them and went, they're like little Christ. They're like these little lights running around everywhere, like, like Christ was. It, it didn't end. We can't, we, we, we can't stomp this thing out. We tried to kill it on a cross. We tried to bury it in a tomb. And, and now they're like everywhere. It's like we smash it. And it went, it's like, remember when you were a little kid and you get the lightning bug? Maybe you didn't do this, but me and my friends, you'd get it and you'd like, so the light would be all over your arm. Okay, well, we were cruel like that. And, but that's like, it's like, Jesus, like, you, you can't kill me. You're just going to spread it everywhere. You're going to explode it into greater existence where it's going to be all over the world. I'll tell you one of the conclusions that I have come to the more I study these verses. I believe the biggest sin that Christ came to remove or redeem was the sin of missing it. I believe that was what he really was coming to deal with. That we had gotten to this place Yet again, you can go study the history of religion and even church history, and you will see it as a pattern that continually repeats itself. And I believe that one of, the, one of, if not the greatest sin that he came to deal with was the sin of missing it. And here's what I mean by that. The sin of making this beautiful, powerful uh, relationship with the creator of the universe into rules, regulations, and religious 
rituals. I believe that's what he was trying to say. Because get this, the Pharisees, who were the most religious of the day, not only did they have all these rules, they even attached rules to the rules. They had like 964 rules to the rules. And as Christ steps in and goes, you have missed it. I have got to redeem this because the thinking is wrong, the belief system is wrong, it is skewed. Everybody's walking around with guilt and shame. They think if they light this, or if they kill that, or if they think they tie this to their forehead, if they think if they don't tie a rope, like this kind of, I mean, literally, they had it down to, on the Sabbath, one of their rules to the rules was no work on the Sabbath. The rule to the rule was you could tie a rope into a knot if the knot could be tied with one hand. But if you used two hands, you were sinning against God. Now what I believe, God was like, you freaking lost your minds. I don't care how you tie a knot, no matter what day of the week it is. But what it is, if you remember we talked about last week, our goal is to always try to contain God rather than letting God release who we are. It's like, I want to be able to put God in this box, because if I allow God to explode me out of this box, then I might have to change. I might actually have to go love somebody that I really don't even like. I might have to actually change some of my belief system, my personal habits. I might have to change the way I view certain races and sexual orientations. If I just allow Christ to be bigger than a baby in a manger. That if I allow him to be bigger than if I have my, my, my Bible reading in the morning, I say my little prayer, then I can go out and be a jerk and be ill all day long because I did my religious thing this morning. Christ came in to say, listen, you're missing it. He, the, the Christ, God, created us for one purpose, to be connected with him, or we could say her, you're like, oh, you believe in liberal. No, I'm being biblical. Genesis 1:27. let us make mankind, humanity in our image and in our likeness. If I look around the room, I see both male and female. So within there is God. So, but to calm every day everybody down, I will go with what you're used to hearing. He created us for one purpose, to be connected with Him in relationship. I want you to let that sink deep, because you've heard it a lot, but you've not received it a lot. Because the reason I can say this, because I heard it a lot, but I continue to think if I strived toward moral perfection, I was more right with God than the person beside me. It's almost like we believe that our faith is about morality instead of spirituality. What we don't understand is morality doesn't affect spirituality, but every time I've watched somebody be connected spiritually, it always transforms them morally. We find this God of relationship within the Trinity itself. And once again, you see cultural history, Father, Son, and Spirit. God was speaking into the context of the day. Because right now, I think He would say, parent, child, and Spirit. You know, today, that's how we would say it, because your parent is male or female, your child could be male or female, you know. And then the Spirit, I believe He intentionally left neutral. For us to understand, it's greater than anything we could think. It's greater than our cognitive recognition. So if at the core of who God is, is this Trinitarian relationship, you know, the Father, Son, Spirit, all right? This, at the core of who God is, is this Trinitarian relationship. And then if everything that's created is created through Christ, and we're made it in God's image, then everything that we find in this relationship and in Christ should be found in us. 
or the Bible is not telling the truth. So what you do is you start deducting it and you start looking at it in other schools of thought to see if this truth, because if it's truth, it transcends all lines. The amazing thing is we do find that it does just that. We have to look no further, believe it or not, than the cells that make up the human body. The cells that make up the human body, each cell of our body is made up of molecules. Every molecule of every cell is made up of atoms. Every atom of every molecule of every cell, guess what it has within it? A Trinitarian relationship. Every single one of them. Protons, neutrons, and electrons. Every single one of them. Every atom at the core of who we are, it's the same thing as the core of who God is. This Trinitarian relationship that cannot be separated. If you separate it out, you no longer have a body. If you separate it out, you no longer have the, as we would call the Godhead, put in our big religious words. And they all work together, this energy, this light, this power. Jesus, I'm the light of the world, right? I'm not making this stuff up. It works together, same as uh, protons and neutrons and electrons. It's all, it's, all, it's all energy, is all it is. It's energy. They said down to its form, all it is is energy. But it's, it's energy working in unison, and it comes together, and it's manifested into matter, physical matter. But it's all energy that once it relates together, create something. For us, it would be the human body. The energy between the proton, the neutron, and electron coming together in relationship gives us the stuff to create the human body. So really, we're energy with a form. Go research it for yourself to find out I'm not off my, I am off my rocker, but, but that has nothing to do with me being honest right here and being truthful, all right? Yeah, I, I tell everybody, man, I got more issues in Sports Illustrated. <laughs> so, yeah, there's no problem there. But this is true. So, I thought, okay, I can't stop there, you know, because I mean, this is all new stuff for me too. Listen, I went to, you know, Mercer University and, and, and was told exactly what I'm supposed to believe about. So, I did a double major in psychology and religion, was told exactly what I'm supposed to believe. I go to seminary and get a master of ministry, then I go get another uh, uh, master's in religious studies, and, you know, I'm, and I'm in the main school of thought, the, you know, here's your borders, here's your guardrail, do not step out of these lanes. So, this is new thinking for me too. But you can't deny it when you see it in Scripture, and then everything in life confirms it. We can't allow ourselves to operate in spiritual fear because of what someone else might believe or think, because they're afraid to discover new truth. It's like the person right now who refuses to go forth with technology. I don't have a computer. I didn't grow up with a computer. I don't need one. I got a pen and paper. That's how I roll. It's usually fear, right? Fear of a learning curve, fear of new things, fear of new truth. All right, that was free. All right. So I decided to go a little bit deeper. I said, okay, let's don't stop at energy, you know, just when, in, in its rawest form. Let's, let's take a look at light. Let's literally look at the word light when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and when I leave, you're the light of the world, and everything's created through him. So, when it comes to light, what does that mean? So, first I looked it up and I realized that light is just a form of energy, exactly. And we fi- first find this truth in Einstein's theory of relativity. Get this, all matter. Everything that's created are a form of energy. In other words, you take a piece of wood, it's energy. But you can burn it and it turns into another form of energy. You take water, you turn it into ice, or you heat it up and it turns into vapor. All different forms of what? Energy. You see, we get this, we've just never been allowed to step out. See, what people think is when we step out into this world, it's going to disintegrate our faith. It's just the opposite. 
When you step into this, it increases your faith and go, this is why I believe in the Christ. This is why. Because it's true. It's true. You know, and I found it, uh, uh, further scientific support in this big, big specific term, electromagnetic energy. All right? This energy, get this, is found throughout the universe. Throughout the whole universe, you have this, this electro, uh, electromagnetic energy. And this energy, as it's found, you can find it in visible light, all right? Like um, the, the flame of a fire or the light of a light bulb, all right? You actually see the light. Do you not see the light in a light bulb? You, you see it. You actually see a fire in your fireplace. You see the energy being manifested physically. It is the same energy. I am not making this up. The same energy that's also invisible. And it's invisible in like radio waves, Invisible in microwaves. You don't look in your microwave going, look at all them waves heating up my coffee. <laughs> you don't see them. All you do is pull it out and it's hot. And you knew they were in there, right? But they're invisible. But it's the same energy that you see being burned in a fire. Is that not crazy? You're the light of the world. It's the same ray, it's the same energy in an X ray. I mean, we would freak out if we saw X rays. You know what I'm saying? You lay down, you're like, oh my gosh, you can't see it, thank God. So put another way, all right, so I'm, I'm like me, I like, I like the little Debbie cakes on the bottom shelf that are easier to get to, right? You don't trip over trying to get to the top. So put another way, it's this. Both matter, whether it be in a chair or a body or a piece of wood, you know, both matter and energy, energy being light, which is also Jesus, I'm the light of the world, which means that's what? Spirit. Right? I mean, if you follow the teachings of Jesus, all right, so it means that both matter and energy, spirit, exist as one. And how do they do that? By being in relationship with one another. By being in relationship. You separate them, they don't exist. You bring them together in relationship, and they exist. How is it you can have a plant that exists, or even a piece of wood, and you put it in your yard, and if you let it lay there long enough, what happens to it? It disintegrates. If you allow the water to heat long enough to turn into vapor, what happens to it? It disappears. It is all about relationship. Now, if we continue this line of reason, we discover in what's called quantum physics. You're like, I want to hear Merry Christmas and baby Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes. Why well, quantum physics stuff? Because it brings the baby Jesus 2,000 years ago who came to be the Christ to life today. That's why we care about this stuff. Because once again, we're missing it because we, we're afraid to go there and the world's saying, you, how can you say that when quantum physics says this and, and the electromagnetic, you know, all the uh, subatomic world says this and it's like, they're the same. The Bible sa it said it thousands of years ago. They're just saying it in different terms now. We're saying the same thing. So, let's go to quantum physics. Okay, the, the, the subatomic world, all right, that's a big word for electrons, neutrons, and protons, all right? So, see, you're going to be able to go out to lunch today and go, well, in the subatomic world, according to quantum physics. Yeah, see, I'm giving you great Christmas fodder to go home, and they think you're brilliant now. But this subatomic world of electrons, neutrons, and protons, get this, they're actually energy working together in relationship with one another that creates matter. So Jesus' words were meant to be taken literally. When he said, you are the light of the world. I am the light of the world, and I am in you, I, you are made through me. Everything that's created was created through this cosmic Christ, this God, this Spirit. And 
And we become that light as we get into relationship with who we are in Christ. You deny it, it's like you said, who gets a light? See, now, now you start seeing these scriptures, who gets a light and hides it? He's like, why would you know this and not walk in it? Why, why, why would you hide it? Why would you dim your light? Why wouldn't you go walk in this? Why you, wouldn't you go celebrate this? Why won't you just receive who you are and not what I'm calling you to do? You see, we think it's about what we're supposed to do. And he's saying, no, you just go be, you don't ask a light to be a light. Hey, listen, when I turn this light bulb on, light bulb, I need you to be a light. Try your best. All right? I need you to do what you need to do. But what it is, it's being what it was created to be, which is what? Light. It's not a striving, it's a resting in. I don't have to strive anymore. We are the light of the world, this light, this energy. And I'm going to tell you, man, it did something for me when I realized that when I, this thing, it won't work now, that I realized that the same energy to create this, to create that, is the same energy that when it comes together, a relationship makes a candle. And that flame, that light, is energy in relationship. And it's manifested into a flame. This is why it was mission critical for Christ, for us to understand and return to this in our life, and for us not to miss it. That it's not what you do, it's who you are. You are the light of the world. You're saying, it's not, I need you to land this plane, Jeff, because that's like, I'm getting a little, little uh, motion sick up here in these clouds of subatomic blah, blah, blah. Jesus made this mission critical statement so clear, yet again, when he opened up the scroll of the book of Isaiah, Old Testament, thousands of years before, written, because they were missing it then too. And he reads this in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. It says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To recover sight, you had to have what once? At once had what? Yes. Had it. And set the oppressed free. And proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The year of Jubilee that we sang about earlier, saying, listen, it's not about rules and regulations. You are the light of the world. You belong to me. You belong to me. I created you. If any of you have ever had a child or a family member that disappears, you know, I shared this with you last year at the Christmas season. The Christmases were horrible at my house for so many years because my oldest brother was a drug addict and an alcoholic, and he disappeared for 13 years and just lived in the streets. We had no idea if he was dead or alive. And I'm telling you, man, Christmas was never the same. My mom always set a plate for him, and he was never there. But I'll never forget when we found him, found him in the streets of L.A. and brought him home, uh, ravaged from crack, smoke and crack, and literally died two years after that. But God brought him home, and I'll never forget that Christmas was probably the happiest I ever saw my mom and dad. Because everything in one that, that they had created came together in relationship on that Christmas. So what he's calling us to is saying, listen, the birth of Christ was God saying, listen, I want you to understand of everything that I want, of everything you've been taught that I'm expecting, is I just want to be in relationship with you. 
I want my love to fill your life. And then once it fills your life, I want it to flow into everyone else's life. You say, Jeff, I just really, I really don't know where I'm landing on all this. Well, let me ask this question and I'll close it out. Which is more spiritual or more easier to believe or to accept? That the Holy Spirit of God impregnated a virgin? Or our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and now we are the light of the world, and we're to go love the world with the love of Christ. So that love is manifested. And once again, you say love, what is love? It has to be manifested in relationship with acts of kindness, acts of forgiveness. It's the giving of grace. That is love. That's the energy, the light being manifested in something we can see and feel. Which is greater? The Spirit of God impregnated a virgin? Or that we are to be the love and the light of Christ to the world?